In the spring of 2020, a mother of four was found stabbed to death sitting inside her vehicle. She was parked just outside of her own home. The 47-year-old had not even taken off her seatbelt. Only moments before law enforcement arrived, the killer had run from the scene. As investigators moved rapidly to put the pieces together, they found that all signs pointed squarely at one individual. A woman that witnesses to the stabbing had overheard screaming. He's mine. You can't have him. He's mine. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Today's case takes us back to early 2020, when the world was descending into uncertainty and varying levels of panic brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. It was in this environment that one woman's personal life was likewise falling into chaos and leaving her distraught and isolated. But is that a defense for murder? Let's take a look. On the evening of May 18th, 2020, in Pella, Iowa, Julie Kuiper was at home caring for her five-year-old. It was just before 8.30 p.m. when she stepped outside of her apartment complex into the fresh air. By the garage doors to the building, there was a maroon-colored truck with a female driver. Julie overheard an argument taking place between the driver and another individual. It was more than just a domestic dispute. Julie thought she saw one of the two individuals step away from the pickup truck with blood covering their face. She placed a call to 911. Yeah, I know. There's a, it looks like a scuffle between a couple. Well, when I saw her get out of the, out of the truck, her face is just all bloody. She looks like she just got in the car and left. This person has a maroon colored truck. And I don't know what they were fighting over. I don't like the horn was honking, and I was trying to mind my own business until I saw her. Is the maroon truck still there? The maroon truck is still there, but the, the other vehicle is like a four-door, or it looks like a Cadillac almost, and it looks like they got that woman got in the car and black. <laughs> it's a cream or light-colored, off-white. It looks like a Cadillac with a on it. Okay, Julie, I'm going to let you go, okay? Okay, all right. Go away. The police response was rapid. Police arrived at the Glenwood apartment complex only a matter of minutes after the white Cadillac and its bloodied driver had left the scene. Pella police officer Cody Roos approached the Ford F-150 pickup truck to find a woman, later confirmed to be 47-year-old Tracy Mondaba, slumped in the driver's seat of the vehicle. Assisted by other arriving officers from the Pella police and the Marion County Sheriff's Office, Tracy was given emergency medical treatment. Sadly, their efforts were not successful. Tracy had been stabbed to death. The medical examiner later found a single stab wound to her chest, which had pierced her heart. Tracy, who was a mother to four children, was a resident of the apartment complex where she was found. It appeared that Tracy had only just arrived home when she was attacked. The incident must have occurred rapidly. Tracy was found with her seatbelt still secured around her. Outside of the truck, investigators noted a small piece of blue material. It appeared to be the finger of a latex glove, torn off during the altercation. The interior of the truck showed the aftermath of a brutal attack. Blood and hair evidence was collected for testing though the results were predictable. Tracy Mondova's DNA was all over the vehicle. She had clearly struggled with her attacker before sustaining the fatal blow to her chest. The Ford F-150 pickup truck that Tracy was driving, however, was not hers. Responding officers at the scene promptly checked on the registration. They found that it was owned by Tracy's boyfriend, who she lived with in the complex, a man named Nicholas Boat. Alongside the name of the registration was Nick Boat's previous address. 
the home that he had moved from only two months prior. Also registered to that address was a second vehicle, a silver four-door Cadillac, one that matched the description provided by Julie Kuiper. That car was often driven by Nick Boat's estranged wife. Lieutenant Shane Cox responded to the call to check in on Nick Boat's former address. They anticipated that Nick's wife, Michelle Boat, would be at home. Parked in the driveway of the house was the silver Cadillac, its hood and wheels still warm to the touch. Whoever had been at driving the car had been doing so only minutes before. In fact, from the time that Julie Kuiper placed her 911 call from the apartment complex to Lieutenant Cox's arrival to the boat residence, only 17 minutes had passed. The locations were less than one and a half miles apart. Knocks on the door of the house went unanswered. Peering through the windows, the officers could see clearly into the residence. Lights had been left on. Someone must be at home. Officer Cox continued to call for a response, while Lieutenant Brian Bigwet took a closer look at the Cadillac. He found a blood spatter on the passenger side mirror. Even more disturbing, a necklace with several full hairs attached hung off of the windshield. The necklace had become wrapped around a wiper blade. Peering inside the car, a collection of gardening tools, including a hammer and other sharp implements, sat in a pile on the floor by the front passenger seat. With them was a pair of disposable blue latex gloves. On top of the seat was a bag, and most curious, a pair of binoculars. The lens cap for these had been removed and sat on the driver's side seat. A second blue glove could be seen resting in the center console. Five full minutes passed with no answer at the house. The visible blood on the vehicle increased the sense of urgency. Well, get in Zerker and find a phone number for Michelle Boat and call her and see if you can get her to answer. Nobody's coming to the door. The uh, rotors on the Cadillac are still hot, but nobody's coming to the door. I can see through most of the house and don't see anybody. <laughs> Walking around the side of the house, Lieutenant Cox spotted movement inside a bathroom through a window. I think she's in this bathroom back here. I can see a little bit of movement, but I can't, the blinds are pulled. When the door finally opened, officers were greeted by an apparently surprised Michelle Boat. She had just been having a shower, she told them, and invited the officers inside. While Michelle sat down to speak with his colleagues, Lieutenant Cox conducted a sweep of the house. This was primarily aimed at ensuring the safety of the officers who had entered, to check that no other individuals were hiding somewhere inside. Noises from the basement drew the lieutenant's attention. The noise turned out to be the washing machine, which was already in mid-cycle with a load of laundry. Partially visible through the clear front door of the machine, the lieutenant could see an odd collection of items for a single load. One jacket, a pair of jeans, a top, socks, and undergarments. Michelle was washing a single outfit. In the bathroom where Michelle had been showering, no clothing had been discarded, though a handful of other items had been. Notably, a set of car keys sat on the bathroom counter. On the key fob, a long dark hair had become attached. It was just like the hairs from the necklace on the car outside. It was just like those on Tracy Mondaba's head. In the kitchen, hanging in full view on the wall, was a calendar. On each day, beginning on March 12th of that year, a single note had been written. Gone, it said, counting down the days. On that day, the 18th of May, Michelle Boat had written, gone, 69 days. Nick Boat had left his wife of 20 years, mother of his two children, on the 12th of March, 2020. 69 days later, his girlfriend was found 
stabbed to death outside of the home they shared. Forty-one-year-old Nick Boat met Tracy Mondaba in mid-February 2020 after she accidentally sent him a friend request on Facebook. They started messaging each other, which led to talking on the phone frequently. Shortly after, they went on their first date. Since they both enjoyed wildlife and the outdoors, they chose to go searching for deer antler sheds around Roberts Creek near Pella. Nick recalled that spending time with Tracy was like being with an old friend. They spoke as though they had known each other their whole lives, he said. They had a connection immediately. At the time, Tracy was still living in Ottumwa, where she had grown up. She was close with her four children, who, by the spring of 2020, were all adults with families of their own. Tracy began driving out to meet Nick in Pella regularly, where he still lived with Michelle and their two teenage children. Nick described his marriage to Michelle as 20 years of misery. He disagreed with how she treated their kids and was convinced throughout their marriage that she never loved him. Indeed, according to Nick, she told him repeatedly throughout the years that she was in love with her ex-husband. On March 11th, after yet another argument, Nick told Michelle that he no longer loved her. He had met someone new, and he was leaving. When Michelle returned home from work the next day, Nick was gone. Michelle's behavior in the weeks and months that followed the separation were erratic. She allegedly assaulted her husband a few days after he left. A subsequent no-contact order against her was violated no less than four times. And she allegedly threatened to kill her nephew. During this time, Tracy Mondaba had become frightened. She and Nick had moved in together at the Glenwood apartment complex at the beginning of April. By that time, Michelle had made disturbing phone calls to her husband and been spotted following them around Pella. Law enforcement deemed her behavior at that time to be non-threatening. In mid-March, Michelle called Nick yet again, this time leaving a message on his voicemail intended for Tracy. And tell the bitch, you know, f whore that you're sleeping with, she messed with the wrong mama. Later that same month, Tracy called the Pella Police Department after spotting Michelle following her all the way between Pella and Ottumwa. Nick worked long shifts at his manufacturing job at Vermeer Corporation, based in Pella. Tracy often drove in to meet him over his scheduled lunch break. On one such occasion, Michelle followed Tracy there, approached the couple in the pickup truck, and told Tracy, I will only tell you this once. Stay away from my husband. After obtaining a search warrant for the boathouse, investigators went back through the home more thoroughly. While standing in the bathroom during his initial walkthrough, Lieutenant Cox had made an observation. The toilet was running water on and off in brief intervals. It sounded as though the tank had been clogged. A team went back in and lifted the lid to the back of the toilet. Inside was a white towel. Inside the towel was yet another blue glove. This one had traces of blood, and a single fingertip missing. The glove matched perfectly with the fingertip found at the scene of the stabbing. The knife used to stab Tracy to death, however, was never recovered. Michelle Boat was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The evidence was overwhelming. One witness at the apartment complex told police that he overheard a scuffle during which a woman's voice stated repeatedly, he's mine, you can't have him. Inside Michelle's car, police uncovered even more physical evidence. Tracy's hairs were found inside the doorframe. Specks of blood had been transferred onto the steering wheel. Bruising from the struggle between the two women slowly emerged on Michelle Boat herself. These were documented in the hours after her arrest, and then again, 36 hours later. Yet somehow Michelle Boat entered a plea of not guilty to the first degree murder charge. There was more to this story, she argued. The case would go to trial. 
Key to the estranged wife's defense was her state of mind. While the state of Iowa determined that Michelle had planned the murder, she insisted it was an act of sudden passion. Michelle did not deny stabbing Tracy, but she insisted she had not wanted to. She grabbed the knife in a moment of desperation and without forethought. This was not first degree murder. At most, she argued, it was manslaughter. But if that was the case, then how was Michelle to explain her behavior in the hours leading up to Tracy's death? Beginning just before 7 p.m. on May 18th, the day of the stabbing, cameras first tracked Michelle leaving her house and driving across town where she would find Tracy. From there, she once again began stalking Tracy's every movement. Security cameras at a Culver's fast food restaurant in Pella captured Michelle Boat driving her 2004 Cadillac at 6.57 p.m. on May 18th. The car does not pull into the restaurant to order food, but rather backtracks from where it came to a laundromat, where Nick Boat's red Ford pickup truck sat parked in front. Michelle watched as Tracy brought her laundry back to the truck and drove off. The 47-year-old was clearly alone in the vehicle. At 7.19, the red pickup is captured driving to the local Burger King drive through Only moments later, the Cadillac follows, driving a distance behind the truck. The parking lot is largely empty, though Michelle chooses to park in behind another vehicle. It appeared that Michelle was actively hiding her presence from Tracy, who at that time showed no indication that she was aware of being followed. While she takes the truck through the drive through for her order, oblivious to the woman following her, another video captured Michelle get out of the car and retrieve an unknown item from her trunk. When exiting the lot, the red truck drives directly past where Michelle is sitting, watching. It is unclear if Michelle ducked out of view inside her car when Tracy passed, but she remains unnoticed. Tracy's next stop was Vermeer, where Nick Boat was working the 3 to 11 shift. She is shown at driving in with the Burger King dinner, followed roughly 20 seconds later by Michelle. The Cadillac parked around a corner in a concealed position that was nonetheless in view of the truck's cab and the couple sitting inside. There, she stayed for over 30 minutes. Michelle watched as her husband and his girlfriend had their dinner and parted ways. By 8.08 p.m., she was following Tracy from the manufacturer's parking lot. The next stop was the Glenwood Apartment Complex. When Michelle's trial commenced, the prosecution painted her as a woman scorned. Seething and angry, she set out that evening to cause harm to Tracy Mondaba. They argued the fact that she wore gloves that day showed that this was not a spontaneous act. In fact, the prosecution said that it was part of a meticulous plan. The calendar found in Michelle's home marked each day since her husband had left her. She had been building up to the day when she could try to get him back and get Tracy out of the way. Scorned, obsessed, seething. It's May 18th, 2020, and a woman by the name of Tracy Mondeball maneuvers a pickup truck through the drive through at the Burger King in Pella, Iowa. Tracy doesn't know it, but as she squeezes that pickup truck through the narrow drive through lane, Tracy's being watched some might even say hunted. Nearby, her hunter watches through the window of a Cadillac. Her hunter is scorned, obsessed, and seething. But there was more than one way to interpret Michelle Boat's disturbing behavior. According to her defense, the calendar was not evidence of a building hatred or malice with the intent to murder, but rather the sign of a heartbroken desperate and dejected wife. Michelle returned home from work one day to find that the father of her children and her husband of 20 years had up and left, 
she was shocked and devastated. The timing of events was crucial. Throughout the period of separation, the COVID-19 pandemic was spreading rapidly and causing varying levels of panic across the globe. After Nick's departure from their home, the conditions brought on by the public health emergency pushed Michelle Boat further into isolation. These circumstances compounded what was already a period of heightened stress and uncertainty in Michelle's life. Remember back to March of last year, how scary the world was. The fear, the chaos, the isolation that we all felt in the early days of the pandemic. That's where Michelle was 69 days before May 18th. Nick Boat testified that he and Michelle owned two vehicles, the silver Cadillac that Michelle often drove and the red pickup truck that Tracy had been driving on the day that she was killed. While Michelle became visibly distraught in court, Nick testified to the beginning of his affair and the last time that he saw Tracy alive. It was typically what we did. She would come and bring me lunch. Any particular reason? Um, so we could spend time together. What did you do after you left Tracy? I kissed her goodbye, and as I was walking back into the building, I waved to her and then went back into work. Is that the last time that you saw Tracy Mondeval alive? Yes. You and Michelle had been married for 20 years? Correct. You had two children together? Correct. And on what date approximately did you begin your affair with Tracy? It was towards the beginning of March. Michelle Boat took the stand in her own defense. Michelle first told the jury that her husband's affair had been a devastating and surprising blow to her. She drank heavily for a period of two weeks non-stop following his decision to leave her. After that, Michelle was hospitalized for mental health treatment for five days in late March. Heart broken, sad, despondent devastated, destroyed, like my whole life had just walked out the door. There weren't going to be any more Thanksgivings or Christmases without him. He was my whole life. Michelle testified that on May 18th, she had only $6 left in her bank account. Her job working on the laundry service at the hospital had been on an on-call basis. She only went in when she was needed. Michelle had not had a day of work or pay since the day that her husband left her. With her last six dollars, Michelle drove to Culver's to buy a chicken meal, she said. Michelle testified that she opted out of buying dinner when the line was too long. She instead drove back to the laundromat and began following Nick's red pickup truck. Her motivation was to check on her husband, to see him, and to beg him to come home to her. She didn't feel like my husband to come back to me. I wanted to know where he lived. I wanted to know he was okay, and I was worried about, worried about him, and I... I wanted to know where he lived so I could go back later and beg him to come home. When Michelle followed Tracy to Nick's workplace, she chose not to get out of the vehicle to speak with him after all. She only watched from a distance. He came out of the building and got in the truck and they ate I would, whatever they got from Burger King, I'm assuming is what they ate, because they ate. And then he turned to her and he kissed her. And then he kissed her again. Michelle testified repeatedly that her aim in following Tracy was to find out where her husband lived. 
she planned to return to the address later to beg him to come home. Yet, as she approached the apartment complex behind Tracy, she would have had his address. There would have been no reason at that point to get out of the car to confront Tracy. But she did so anyway. Michelle told the jury that she did not approach the truck with the knife in hand. Only after Tracy began hitting and insulting her did she reach into her car for a weapon. She grabbed at whatever was readily available, which was a knife on the passenger seat. At that moment, Michelle stated that she had been overwhelmed by two factors. The first was the realization that the apartment complex, where her husband and his new girlfriend were living, was the same one where she and Nick had lived as newlyweds. It had been their first home together. The second trigger was the smell of cigarette smoke. Michelle testified that years earlier, she and Nick had quit smoking together. As part of their motivation, they saved money to put towards a new truck, the very same vehicle that Tracy was now driving. As Michelle approached the cab, she caught the distinct smell of smoke. She claimed to have reached inside at that point for Tracy's purse to check for a pack of cigarettes, she said, to confirm her suspicions. When Tracy began hitting her, she lost control. He was hitting me and hitting me and hitting me. And I had my hands up. She's yelling at me. And I just, I just snapped. And I grabbed the knife and I just stabbed her and I, Dropped the dire. Upon cross-examination, Michelle told the prosecutor that she was wearing gloves when she approached the truck due to pandemic precautions. At that time, many people were wearing gloves whenever leaving the house. She was given the disposable blue gloves at work and kept them in her car for ease of access. Curiously, the state never questioned Michelle about when exactly she chose to put on the gloves despite this being a key piece of evidence to prove her premeditation of the murder. Did she place them on before she left the house or closer to the time she approached Tracy in the truck? She was questioned as to what item she may have retrieved from her trunk when parked at the Burger King. Was she getting out her gloves or the knife at that point in time? Retrieving either of these items in advance would also have established her premeditation. Michelle testified that she simply did not recall getting anything from the trunk of the car at all. The gardening tools and other implements sitting in the front of her car were also explained away. Michelle claimed to have moved those into the vehicle for protection. After Nick had left her, she kept a baseball bat by the front door and another knife in her nightstand as well. Michelle, why did you have a knife in your car? Because my husband was always my protector and I was scared when he left. I was scared. If she had not planned to attack Tracy with the knife, why had she continued to struggle with her? Tracy was found still wearing her seatbelt. To end the altercation, the only thing Michelle needed to do was take one step backwards. Don't know. It was a struggle. We were having a tussle, a struggle, a fight, a. And then you chose to stab her, right? I yes, I snapped. I snapped, and I stabbed her. Yes. And then you stepped back, right? Her attempts to cover up evidence after the crime were done in a panic, she said. Michelle testified that she had hidden the knife used to kill Tracy under her bathroom sink. She had not divulged its location to the police when questioned, nor had she admitted any responsibility at that time. I asked you questions. Yes. You denied knowing anything about Tracy's killing. Yes, I did. They asked you multiple times to tell you tell them your side of the story, right? 
Yes. And then the police tell you, Tracy has been hurt seriously, right? Yes, yes. And your response was, God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Yes, I said that. The prosecution emphasized that Michelle Boat had countless opportunities on the evening of May 18th to change her behavior, to stop what she was doing, and simply go home. They painted her as a hunter, stalking her prey until the moment of attack. She had mapped out the murder as her revenge. Conversely, the defense pointed to how poorly planned the murder actually was. The necklace on the windshield, blood spatter on the vehicle, and evidence at the scene directly linked the crime to Michelle. In addition, there were two eyewitnesses at the complex who overheard the argument and viewed parts of the exchange. This was not an example of a meticulously planned murder. It simply could not have been premeditated, as the state argued. The jury deliberated for just 45 minutes before unanimously coming to its verdict. I'll have you stand and listen to the reading of the verdict. In the matter of the state of Iowa versus Michelle Lee Bowe, we the jury find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree, verdict form number one. Is that your verdict, members of the jury? Yes. So say all of you. A first degree murder conviction in Iowa carries a mandatory sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. On February 7, 2024, the State Court of Appeals, after hearing Michelle's appeal, affirmed the life sentence. At the time of her conviction, Michelle Boat was 56 years old. Tracy Mondaba is remembered as a loving and devoted daughter, sister, mother, grandmother, and girlfriend. She was sassy, funny, and always looking on the bright side. Tracy is sorely missed by her four children, 10 grandchildren, as well as Nick Boat. And that was the tragic case of Tracy Mondaba and the conviction of Michelle Boat. A special thank you to our newest premium members for supporting our work here at JTL. Wendy, Ty Whitmere, Paula, and I am Cordelia. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're interested in becoming a member, then check out the membership tab on our channel homepage. Either way, thanks for watching. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.